Hey, my name is Cameron. I'm one of the pastors here. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for clicking on this video. We truly believe that this message that you're about to hear can change your life and make a positive impact for you and your family. If you could take a second, if you haven't already, subscribe, like this video, comment on it, uh, share it with a friend or a family member. Uh, we truly believe that this is something that we wanna share with everybody because we believe everybody's life is better with God in it. So I hope that you can do that. Thank you so much for doing that. And now let's jump into what David has to say in this message. So uh, I'm gonna take you back to 1988, 1989. It was sometime around there. Um, got a picture here for you of a submarine. My dad planted a church in the southernmost city in the world. It's a city called Ushuaia, Argentina. We were living in Buenos Aires. This is way down at the bottom end of the Patagonia. And, and he said, Dave, I want to scout out the land before planting this church. Uh, I want to send the guy that I'm gonna, that's going to pastor the church, the Argentine, and then I'm going to send uh, a friend of mine, an American, down there. Problem is, the guy from America didn't speak any Spanish. The guy from, from Argentina didn't speak any English, and these guys need to be talking about it. Dad's like, hey, I can't go. Something came up. Can I send you down to be a translator between the two guys? And I was like, absolutely, sure. So it was a real fun weekend. We went down, and, and, uh, and I was the translator. Um, and, uh, and I remember we were at this pier, you know, we, we did several things to kind of scout out the land and, and see the city and whatnot. And at one point we're on this pier and this is not the submarine, but there was a submarine that was docked in Ushuaia, which is really cool. Like how often do you see a black submarine at a pier, right? And so I'm like, well, I'm going on. <laughs> so, so I like you know, look around and, and the, the hatch, you know, wherever the, wherever it opens, I don't know if at the top of that little thing up there, there's a, a, a trap door or something like that, but it was open. And I'm like, I'm going down in, <laughs> into this submarine, right? I know it was like the coolest thing. It was like, how often do you get to crawl into a submarine? So they're like, Dave, I don't know if you should. I was like, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. So, so, uh, so yeah, so I like take a few steps towards this thing. And I'm, not this one, but the, the submarine, there was like a, uh, a little platform that went out. And so I'm walking across the platform and then there were some Russian guys. It was a Russian submarine. The, I know, it was just like this. And, and the guys, you know, they're like, hey, you know, they yell at me and they say something in Russian, which I'm sure meant like, get off, yeah. So, and, and the, the machine guns that they held tell me they were like serious about it. So they, they didn't point them at me. So I was like, all right, but I don't know what you're saying, but I get the point. So, and you're like, Dave, what if you, you know, what if you'd have gone down in the submarine, they would have closed the hatch and gone down and like, you would have been down trapped there for months. And I'm like, yeah, but think of how many sermon illustrations I could have gotten out of that thing. Dave, what if they shot you dead? They're like, yeah, but think how many sermon illustrations I would have gotten from it. So, Anyway, so uh, that was as close as I ever got to a Russian submarine. I'm going to use this, speaking of Russian submarines, I'm going to use this as an illustration for self-sufficiency. Does anyone remember the Kursk? It was a submarine tragedy that happened in 2000. And a Russian submarine named the, the Kursk, it sank in the Barents Sea. It was supposed to go out and do this uh, naval trial experience, and something happened. There was a malfunction with the, uh, with the torpedoes, and it exploded, and that set off a trigger reaction where other torpedoes exploded inside this submarine, and it sank to the bottom of the sea, and most of the 118 crew members died instantly, but there were a few who survived the blast, and they were in a compartment number nine, and they survived. There was just a handful of them. They were in this compartment nine. And people found out about it because, like, the Norwegian Navy heard the blasts. You know, they, they, and others sensed it on the Richter scale. And it was like, something's going on. And so they signaled to Russia, and they said, we can help. We figured out what that was. We can help. And... Russia, it was Vladimir Putin's, one of his first calls as president, and he said, no, 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 we got this. We got this. We don't need your help. There were guys down at the bottom of the sea who were trapped in compartment nine for 
hours, if not days. We don't know exactly at what point they died. But Russia had this mentality that was like, we don't need help. We're good. We would rather men die than ask for help. And the Russians, uh, the Norwegians said, we can help, we can help. We don't need help, we're good. And because of that, all 118 men died at the bottom of the ocean. When I heard the story on the radio back in 2000, the way it was portrayed to me that the men down in the ship said, no, 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 we don't need help, we're good. I don't know if that's true or not, but at least the government said that. We don't need help, we're good. We would rather die, we would rather have men die than ask for help. So, almost all of the men died from the explosions, but some died just because they ran out of oxygen. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, is a spirit of self-sufficiency. Most of us will never be in a tragedy like a submarine disaster, but all of us can fall victims to a spirit of self-sufficiency, where we say, I don't need help, I'm good. And in doing so, we squeeze out our need for Jesus. This is what happened to the Laodiceans. Is it Laodiceans or Laodiceans? I don't know, but we're going to talk about the Laodiceans today, the self-sufficient church. So this map here that I'm going to show you, we've been talking about the, the letters from Jesus to the seven churches in Revelation, and this is a mail route. This is an actual road that ties all these cities together. There are seven cities that Jesus writes letters to the seven churches in those cities. We start off in Ephesus, a little recap. This was a hardworking church, but they lost their first love. And and Jesus says to them, get back to loving. Otherwise, this whole church thing that you're doing, it doesn't amount to anything. Then we go to Smyrna. We talked about that in the second week. This is a poor church, but Jesus saw them as rich. Then there was Pergamum. Remember, this is the snake city. This is the, they were really good at dying for Jesus, but they weren't very good at living for Jesus. They were, and and Jesus says to them, just give me, don't just give me the big yeses, give me the little daily yeses as well. Then we go down here to Thyatira. They were really proud of their tolerance towards sin. And because of that, they were bringing on, they were threatened. They were running the risk of bringing on the wrath of God. Then we have Sardis. This is the the church that thought that they were alive, but they were actually dead. And then Philadelphia, they weren't flashy. They weren't talented. There wasn't anything super special about them except that they were just faithful. We talked about that last week. And then there's Laodicea. And this is the lukewarm church. A little bit about Laodicea. Laodicea was founded at a crossroads between two major trade routes, so it was perfectly located for commerce. They had three major industries, gold refining, which led to banking, okay, so they put their, their uh, currency on the gold standard. They had three major industries, the, the gold refining, which led to banking, clothing manufacturing, and a medical school that specialized in eye salve, okay, and that helped people's eyes heal. People came from all over the world to Laodicea to get their eyes healed. Business was booming. This is a a city that had so much money. They spent it so much, so much money on entertainment. Why? Because they could. The biggest cities in that area at the time, they only had, at the most, they had two theaters, but Laodicea, sorry, most cities only had one theater, Laodicea, had two. Why? Because they could. (laughs) Because they just had so much money that they wanted to spend on entertainment, right? The the largest cities in the world at the time, I think Ephesus was one of them, they only had two markets. Laodicea had four. Why? Because they could. Because they were super wealthy, and they could. There were 4,500 shops in all of their markets. So super wealthy town, they were doing fine. They were like, no, we're good. We got this. We're taken care of. An earthquake came in 60 AD, and Rome offered to rebuild the city. You know what Laodicea said? We're good. You don't need to take care of us. We're self-sufficient. We got all of our bases covered, and they rebuilt the city on their own. Why? 
because they were so proud of their self-sufficiency. They were so proud of the fact that they didn't need anybody's help. Well, as the city grew, there was one area where they needed help, and that was with their water supply. The Lycus River and a few other streams that flowed into the city, they would kind of like dry up for several months out of the year. And so, so they just didn't have a good water supply to handle a large population, right? In the beginning of the city, it was fine because there's a few people. As the city grew, you have so many people and you need a good water supply. So because they were wealthy, they, they came up with an idea that had never been done in history before. They said, hey... We've got this city called Hierapolis, which is only six miles away, and they have hot water, hot uh, thermal springs. Let's tap in some water from Hierapolis. Let's create these underground water aqueducts that bring water from Hierapolis, the hot water from Hierapolis, and we'll pipe in some cold water from Colossae, because the Colossi had these, these mountain streams that would flow into it. They had the cold water. Hierapolis had the hot water. And Laodicea said, hey, let's, let's pipe this in. Let's create these, these underground water aque- aqueducts that will bring in hot and cold water into our city. Pretty cool, right? You see these uh, underground aqueducts here. It had some clay on the inside that lined these pipes. And the pipes were all underground. The reason for that is because it just kind of made it easier for their enemies to not be able to come in and just kind of cut off their water supply. So they they put them underground, and then they had these this these this clay, uh, and uh, and they piped in the cold water from Colossae, hot water from Hierapolis, and then Laodicea had the lukewarm water. So if you're ever looking at your faucets at home, and it says H. And C, <laughs> you think it's for hot and cold. It's not. It's for Hierapolis and Colossi. And the L faucet is not lukewarm. <laughs> it's Laodicea. That is such a dad joke, you guys. <laughs> but that's where the magic happens. There's dads, there's jokes, and where they overlap on the Venn diagram, that's where the magic happens. So, all right. So, yeah. So, Hier- that, but that's a good way to remember it, right? Like H is for Hierapolis, hot. C is for Colossi, cold. L is for Laodicea, lukewarm, right? So you'll never forget it now. So, uh, but the problem is water came in through these pipes and they, they opened them up. They opened up the water. They let the water flow. The water flows through these pipes. It gets to Laodicea. What they didn't anticipate was that there was this chemical reaction that happened as the water combined with the clay And it just created this emetic effect. It it created this effect that caused people to vomit. There was something about the the reactions and the sediments and just all of it. It was just bad. Once the water gets to Laodicea, not only had it lost its hotness and it became lukewarm, and not only had it lost its coldness and it became lukewarm by the time it gets to Laodicea, but when they drink it, because it had this weird reaction with the clay, people would vomit immediately. They drank it. And they're like, woo we got water. And then they drank it. They're like, ah, this is awful. Because all of a sudden, they're drinking something that they're not supposed to be drinking, and their bodies rejected it. Everyone knew about the vomiting of water in Laodicea. You know what happened, though? In time, they got used to it. In time, they were able to drink the water And then it was the visitors and the merchants from other cities and the tourists that would come and drink the water. And they're like, you know, (laughs) they're they're vomiting now. This is so funny. And you know, that's how, you know, middle school kids would like tease the new kid. That's like their initiation into the new gangs or whatever. You know, that's that's what they did, right? Ah, you're a foreigner. Let's get you to drink the water, drink the water. (laughs) Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, so funny. Right? Everyone knew about this bad, lukewarm water that made people vomit. The other question, before we move off of the historical background, if you wanted to conquer a city like this, what would you do? What would you do to a guaranteed way of destroying the city is to cut off their water supply, right? And since Laodicea didn't have water of their own, and they were piping in water from other cities, they knew that all someone would have to do, all one of their enemies would have to do is cut off their water supply, and they'd be toast. They'd be dead. 
they'd, be, they'd have to surrender. So what did they do? They got really good at making compromises with their enemies in order to not be attacked. So the spirit of Laodicea was one of compromise. It was so prevalent in the city, it was also prevalent in the church. The church just kept making friends with the world over and over until they lost all of their convictions and lost all of their principles, lost their faith in Jesus. So let's see what Jesus has to say to them. Revelation 3, 14 says, to the angel of the church in Laodicea, right, these are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I'll get to what that means in a second. I know your deeds, Jesus says, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither cold or hot, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. He's using imagery that everybody knew about. Everybody knew about lukewarm, nasty, putrid water, right? They'd all vomited it before. They all knew about it. And Jesus is saying, yeah, remember that? That's kind of like what you are. I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Why is it better to be cold than lukewarm? So contrary to what a lot of us or many of us might have thought growing up reading this passage, God isn't saying, hey, you're better off hating me than being completely indifferent to me. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying it's better to be a complete pagan than to be a Christian who watches too much TV. That's not what he's saying. What's God saying? He's saying, I wish you were cold and refreshing like the waters of Colossae, or I wish you were hot and healing and therapeutic like the hot waters of Hierapolis. But the spirit of self-sufficiency is making you think you have no need for me, and it's disgusting. So fill in the first thing here if you want. Jesus has expectations of us, of all of us, all of us Christians, that we be healing and refreshing. You guys, we can sneak into heaven by the skin of our teeth, right? We could live this Christian life being selfish and having it all be about ourselves. We could always think about what we can get rather than what we can give. Or we could ask God to just make us healing and refreshing people towards others. Last year, I went and visited a friend of mine who turned 50. He was the best man at my wedding, and and, uh, and getting there was a little bit of a hassle. You know, I'd, uh, he's in, in Wisconsin, and my flight was delayed, and so it was just a hassle getting there. But, but uh, you know, I had to rent a car in Minneapolis and drive the rest of the way because my flight was canceled. Anyways, I just couldn't miss the party, and so I get there as a surprise, and, and uh, just really, really fun being with him. And, and, uh, and I got back, and Melissa said, so how was your trip? How was it? And after spending, I don't know, two or three days with him, I came back and I, I said, I said, Melissa, that was, the best way I could describe it is, that was so healing for my soul. He was just such a replenishing person. He was so refreshing. He asked insightful questions. He shared deep insights. He's a good man. And the grace that he extended just kept making me say over and over again, this guy's a real Christian. One of those people, right? We all have people in our lives that are like that. They just, they just refresh us. They heal us. Their words are therapeutic. This guy's a real Christian. That's what I just kept saying. It was, it was replenishing for my soul. It was healing for my soul. So what else does Jesus tell them? He says, verse 17, he says, you say I am rich. I've acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched Pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. For many people, that's where our dreams start, right? I just want to get to the place where I don't need anything from anyone. I just want to get to the place where I have everything I could ever need. And I hate to tell you this, but that dream is flawed. It's a bad dream. Jim Carrey says it so well. Great quote by Jim Carrey. He says, I hope everybody could get rich and famous and will have everything they ever dreamed of, so they will know that it's not the answer. Talk about teeing it up for the gospel, right? (laughs) Sets you up right there. So let's get there. What's the gospel? So the second point before we get to that is we're in danger when we seek the gift more than the giver. 
As we've mentioned before, this is why we tithe, this is why we give, because in doing so, we're saying, Lord, protect my heart from greed. Lord, I'm going to give you this because I'm, as, do, as I'm doing this, I'm, I'm recognizing that you are everything. Everything I have is from you. If I can take a little bunny trail on that. Last week, I said, if no new gifts ever came back, it came to Shadow Rock, if no one ever served another extra hour here, we'd be fine. We'd figure out a way to make it happen figure out a way to make, make it work. But this is about your blessings. This is about you. And you all knew what I was saying, right? <laughs> we could tighten the belt, and we could cut back on, on all kinds of ministry that we're doing, but I just don't believe that God has called Shadow Rock to be an us-for-no-more kind of church. It happens to churches all the time where they, they hunker down, and they're like, because giving's down, okay, we just got to hunker down, and and start thinking about inward, right? We could become a navel-gazing church, Shadow Rock, just thinking about ourselves. But I just believe that God has called us to so much more than that. God's going to do some amazing things in us and through us so we can be a blessing to our community, bring, bring people in our community to the family of God, people around the world into a relationship with Jesus in really unique and creative ways. And yes, giving is going to be a part of that. I just wanted to qualify that statement before anyone says, oh, so they don't need my help. <laughs> so I just wanted to make sure we, uh, we, we covered that. No, the more we give, the more of an impact we can have. And the more giving, the more blessings come into your life. The, be- the blessings may not come in the way that you're expecting or the way that you hope. You're like, man, I didn't get the Lamborghini. <laughs> I tithe and then I didn't get the Lamborghini. What's up with that God? Right, like that doesn't always doesn't always give you what you want, but he always blesses you. He just does it in ways that he knows are best for us. But there's always blessings, okay? And they're always good. So when I say that we're in danger when we seek the gift more than the giver, there's more than just, there's more here than just don't be materialistic, okay? We're going to drill down on this a little bit. There's another time in scripture when Laodicea is mentioned. You know when that is? It's when Paul wrote a letter to the church in Colossae, which is the book of Colossians, right. So Paul is writing a church to this letter to this church in the town that supplies all the cold water for Laodicea, because once again, they're kind of sister cities. And he writes a letter to them because this heresy had crept into the church in Colossae, and the heresy taught that Jesus was just a created being, Okay. Just like us. Jesus is just like us. Inherently, Jesus is no different from us. And Paul wrote the whole book of Corinthians, or sorry, Colossians, to correct this theology that taught that Jesus is just another created being. He corrected that by writing to them in the book of Colossians. Basically, he said that all that God is, Jesus is too. And then at the end of the book, he says, read this letter to the church in Laodicea. Because the same heresy had crept into the church in Laodicea. This whole heresy, this, ah, Jesus is just our big brother. He was just born of God, just like us. And to that, Jesus says, these are the words of the amen, the faithful and the true witness, verse 14, the ruler over God's creation. Jesus is saying, I'm the first, I'm the last. Everything came from me. I am self-existent with the Father. I was never created. I am the everything of God. And here's where that whole Jesus was created heresy is problematic. If Jesus was created, then he's not self-existent, is he? And what do I mean by self-existent? It means that you didn't need anything in order to exist. Just always was. Okay, so if Jesus was created, he wasn't self-existent. If he wasn't self-existent, then he's not eternal, right? Right? But he is eternal, and here's why that matters. Because sin necessitates the shedding of blood. It says in Hebrews, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. A bull or a ram or a sheep can cover over people's sins under the old sacrificial system. But to take away sins, especially to take away the sins of the whole world, everyone who ever existed and everyone who ever will exist, that requires what? An eternal sacrifice. So God couldn't just say, oh, let's just, you know, 
Make him sacrifice more sheep. It doesn't work. It needs to be an eternal sacrifice. You can't just say, oh, just any, any human being can do it. No, it has to be an eternal sacrifice to pay an eternal debt, right? He actually couldn't have even said, oh, I'll just make an angel do it. Angels are created beings. An angel couldn't do it. So, you know, that's where Jesus stood up and said, it has to be me, right? Because only Jesus is eternal with the Father. Only God is eternal. So he did. He stepped up and he said, it's got to be me. But if we think that Jesus is kind of like our big brother who attained Godhood because he just did the sacrifice, inevitably we're going to think, well, of course Jesus did that. Of course Jesus endured six hours of agony on a Friday afternoon on a cross. Of course he did that. He goes from being kind of like created like us to being God. I'd do that. I'd make that trade every day of the week. I'd do the same if it meant that I could become a god forever. I met a couple one time, and they were very candid, and they said, yeah, before we were Christians, and the lady said, I never understood why Christians always talked about loving Jesus. She said, Jesus is my big brother, and loving your brother is kind of (laughs) creepy. Very honest, right? She had this mentality that Jesus is no different, really, inherently, than we are. He's not self-existent. He's just kind of created being just like us. And then her husband said, yeah, I never understood why God chose Jesus to redeem the world instead of me. You only think those kinds of thoughts if you have this mentality that Jesus is a created being just like us. But Jesus in his nature is so different from us. He's self-existent. He always was. He didn't need anything else in order to exist. But if Jesus is a created being like us, then eventually you kind of get to the point where you just don't need him. And then the next logical step to this heresy is that righteousness is really up to you, right? If Jesus isn't eternal, then we're still dead in our sins, and we have, there's, there's no indwelling spirit. Ultimately, if you want to become a good person, it's up to you to produce your own righteousness. I had a friend when we were living up in, in Utah. He was a polygamous Mormon, and just as a disclaimer, um, I will mention often that I have friends that are polygamous Mormons. I am not a polygamous Mormon, just so you know. I only have one wife, and we're happily married. <laughs> so whenever I talk about my friends that are polygamous Mormons, just know that it's, I'm not talking we, okay? It's, uh, it's them, okay? So I had this friend. His name's Nathan, and he was a polygamous Mormon. And, and by the way, before I tell the story of, of how he, he changed, he became a Christian, he, um, his, his, you know, we often think of polygamous Mormons as, as, as being... Um, kind of these creepy old men. And, but in this case, it was his wife who was like, do you believe that Joseph Smith is a true prophet? And he's like, of course I believe that. She's like, then you better get yourself a second wife or I'm gonna divorce you. Crazy, right? Yeah, so here's this guy who's struggling with the whole thing of God's righteousness. It just doesn't make sense. Why does the Bible talk so much about God's righteousness? Why do people celebrate God's righteousness? It just doesn't make sense. He says, it's our righteousness that matters. And passages like Jesus saying, apart from me, you can do nothing. Just messed with him. It messed with his thing. He just wrestled with it, wrestled with it. Jehovah Sidkenu. It's it's one of the names of God in the Old Testament. What does it mean? Does anyone know? The Lord is our righteousness. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense, right? The Lord is our righteousness. Righteousness is up to us. I don't understand this is what he kept saying. I don't understand. Righteousness is up to us. And these passages just mess with them. How is the Lord our righteousness? It's up to us to produce our righteousness. Eventually, Scripture got through to him, and he opened his heart to Jesus, and the Spirit of Jesus entered his life, and he was transformed. See, when we put our faith in in what Jesus did on the cross, there's this exchange that happens. And we get his perfection because he took our sinfulness. 
And only God is perfect. We know that we need to be perfect in order to go to heaven. If you read James 2.10 or Matthew 5.38, it's like needing to get an A plus in order to get, in, and get into heaven. And you failed the test, so you go to the professor and you say, can you just let me pass? Can you just, you know, let me in? Can you just let me pass the course? And he says, yeah, it doesn't work that way. I accept exchanges, so you need to get someone who got an A plus and exchange with your failing grade. Well, Jesus was willing to do that. He took our failing grade in exchange for his perfect grade. He lived the life that we could never live. He got an A plus at the cross. He exchanged his perfect life for our sinful lives. And the only way he could make an exchange with every human being in the world who comes to him is if he's eternal, right? That's an impossibility if Jesus was created. So this heresy creeps into the Laodicean church, and over time, you end up with a church that's full of a bunch of people who call themselves Christians. They give lip service to Jesus, but in reality, they are self-sufficient. They don't need anything. They don't need anything from you. They don't need anything from their neighbors. They don't need anything from Jesus. And God likes us because we're rich. So when you're self-sufficient, you just don't need Jesus. So this is a church that started out with a group that loved Jesus, but decades later, as another generation comes in, heresy creeps in and causes this new group to get to the place where they just don't need or want Jesus anymore. And that's why I don't believe that this church in Laodicea was saved. If they all died at once, I don't think any of them would go to heaven. Why do I think that? Look at how Jesus describes them, verse 17. You do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, naked. That's not how Jesus describes his bride. Wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, naked, spit you out of my mouth. That's the kind of verbiage he used with the Pharisees. People who pretended to have a relationship with him, but were working against him the whole time, denying his deity. So what does he tell them to do? Verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and your white uh, and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. You see what he's doing here? This is, this is a fancy term for he's contextualizing the gospel. He, we'll talk about that next week when we talk about evangelism. It's gonna be a really fun message. But he's basically saying, you know how you have gold that doesn't satisfy? Come to me for the real thing. You know how you have really expensive clothes in this town and yet you still have the sense of shame? You still feel empty? Come to me, I'm gonna cover your shame. You know how you have this clinic that heals eyes and helps people see better? Well, your values are so out of whack because you have no spiritual vision. Come to me and I'll help you see things straight. This is a come to Jesus invitation. This is Jesus saying, surrender your life to me but it can't happen if we're self-sufficient, if we think we have everything that we need. That brings us to the third thing. Salvation only comes when we realize that we are spiritually bankrupt. Salvation only comes when we realize that we have nothing to bargain with God over for our righteousness. For years, I thought of, of my relationship with God like a, a bank, a bank account. And every time I did good things, it built up my bank account. Every time I sinned, you know, I made a withdrawal. It's okay to make withdrawals as long as you got enough in the account, right? Maybe many of us think that way. There came a point where I realized I am spiritually bankrupt. All my righteousness is filthy rags, as scripture says. I am spiritually poor. And that's when it began. That's when I was like, oh, God, I get it now. All of my righteousness is, only comes from Jesus. My account is only full because of the righteousness of Jesus. He filled my bank account when I put my faith in him. So why is Jesus so relentless in his pursuit of us or in his pursuit of lost people? Why? Because he loves us. You see here in verse 19, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Then he gives the promise to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. 
Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And that brings us to the good news. No matter how many steps you've taken away from God, it's only one step back. This applies to all of us, right? Today, if you're here and you've been self-sufficient and you've been living for yourself all these years and you want to give your life to Christ, he's only one step away. If you're a Christian who's been running from the Lord and you've become complacent, you've begun, begun compromising, I've got good news for you. Jesus is only one step away. And if you've been growing in the Lord and you want to go deeper in your walk with Jesus, he's only one step away. So here's how we're going to do this. I'm going to pray, and the worship team is going to sing a song. And as they sing, if your heart cry is, I want to take a step toward Jesus, then come forward, come to the communion elements, and bring them back to your seat, and we'll take communion together, okay? And whether this is, this is your first step towards Jesus, and you're starting a whole new relationship with Jesus, or whether this is your hundredth step or your thousandth step towards Jesus, it doesn't matter. The main thing is that you have a yes in your heart today. And that yes is symbolized by coming to receive the communion elements. Let's sing. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you found this message meaningful, impactful, and life-changing. We believe that everybody's life is better with God in it. So if you would like, you could share this video with maybe somebody who doesn't already know Jesus, and you can play a part in spreading the gospel. If you would like to take next steps with our church, you can check out some of the small groups that we offer here. And we also encourage you to give. When you are giving, you're not just giving to Shadow Rock Church, but you're giving through it. Through your generosity, you are partnering with God and allowing the ministries here to flourish and you're helping people along the way. So thank you so much for your generosity. Thank you and we'll see you next time.